Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 5 of the Roker Report. You join us in the middle of an international break for the World Cup qualifiers off the back of a paint-by-numbers victory for England over the mighty Maltese. Uh, with me tonight, we've got Tom, Gav, Callum and James. And the first point of order should be England. Who cares? Not me. Anybody. <laughs> Not Gav. Dad. Jeez, <laughs> no, I was like... It's painful, isn't it? it? It never gets easier. It's 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 almost worse than watching Sunderland because I have no connection with not one of those players. Um, the continue to select Wayne Rooney, who again I can't get my head around that, um, and the playing the team who, I mean, it's like it, it's it's like playing a pub team, isn't it? The, who who have bought? I got them. I'm sure Michael Mifsud came on. And I had him on chat my house 15 years ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, just, it was just poor. Um, but there we are. It's, 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 it's the same, same as usual, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like all teams we support, we just struggle. <laughs> I think I fell, I think yeah, I fell this, out of love. It's never to feel any good. I fell out of love with, in- Go on, Callum, I sure. fell out of love with international football. I think <laughs> when England played a friendly against uh, Holland at Villa Park, it was I think I was about 16 at the time. And... I've never watched anything worse in my entire life, and <laughs> you you watch it, and it's I mean, the, like I've said, it's players who we all know they don't. A lot of them probably don't deserve to be there. They're picked based on commercial decisions, and it, it's a bunch of you know, it's a, it's a bunch of overpaid players who think that they're not that bad when actually they're probably not. They're not. They're not like a world elite. They're not Germany standard. You know what I mean? And. It's so interesting playing. though that yeah. when you say that, that if you look at our younger teams like the under 17s through the under 21s they seem to pull out good results constantly the, I think it was the under 19s beat Holland 3-0 the other night and like walked them off the park basically they're absolutely top notch so I think you've got to ask some questions of like what turns players off from the younger age groups where we seem to be so dominant or at least producing quality players like, where do we go wrong later down the line? Yeah, do you think it's like a lack well, of... I think certainly with regard to... Do you think it's a lack of continuity from the youth teams to the, the main national side, that there's no, like, steady approach or or formation that's set through all the ranks? It's it's England just seem to play... play well... Pick, pick names. They don't pick well, players for a system, the, do they? Yeah, I'm... I'm, I'm I would agree that's probably been a big issue, like because you can see other countries have clearly followed that path and been quite successful. But uh, I mean, I mean, given given even given Southgate four games is probably a, a good step in the right direction with that in mind because at least he's been in the system for a few years now, and he knows especially that. Well, we we know as as English. Men, or England fans. I don't know if I call myself a fan, but we know we know as we know as Englishmen. I guess that. There's not been enough in certainly in the last five, six, seven years with England, and um, there's not been enough young players put through. At, at the minute, they're at a stage where they've got to do it because there's so many of the old guard have, have just moved on, and there's only really Cahill, Hart, and, and really Rooney there now. So you you could really do with that continuity when bringing players. But you through, look at you having a manager. No, like you look South at the under twenty one. Yeah, you look at the under twenty one team. I think a few years ago, the captain was Michael Mancien. You know, like the, cap- the captain of the under, the captain of the under twenty ones. And you know, like Connor Wickham played up front for the under twenty ones for years. Those two players, they're never going to be senior squad standard. But there's such hmm. they 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 pick all the the best players like Rashford and Sterling and people like that. Sort of John Stones at like eighteen, nineteen, and the and the under twenty one team just becomes a breeding ground for players who. Realistically, are never gonna are never gonna get to the senior standard, or or perhaps they they are at the senior standard, but they're not at teams where they're going to offer the commercial advantages that players at Man United or Chelsea or Arsenal are going to offer. So you know, I think there's I think there's a without in mind, Callum, that there's a shout for maybe Jordan Pickford in the future between the sticks for England. I can see them going for a Sunderland player basically as a goalie or something like that do you know what I mean Cause although obviously it's a very crucial yeah. position on the pitch and in the team it's not it's like being the bass player in a band isn't it no one really cares do you know what I mean you've got to have one but if you can't do that Jill, it's it's not really expected well, kind of, yeah, between the I mean, sticks have kind of got the same issue haven't they with Rooney in Hart because really yeah. really, who, mm. who's going to display Joe Hart we've got some better keepers than Joe Hart and that can't I can't see yeah. any of them being picked ahead of them when when fit. No, so you know. he makes money, doesn't he? It, it all boils down to the FA 
and the England national team at the minute is is just the idea that the FA need to make money, and they're like, you can't you can't drop Joe Hart because Joe Hart rakes in a load of money through sponsorship. So oh, I, think I mean, like, if, you, if, you've, if you've got if you've got Jack Wilshire in an England shirt, uh, advertising for sponsors for Nike or you know yeah. McDonald's or, or whoever the England Vauxhall, whoever the England sponsors are, how many people around the world are going to know Jack Wilshire? How many people around the world are going to know Danny Drinkwater? It's a good McDonald's, point. McDonald's, that'd be an interesting one, Callum, that you, you brought that you know, one up. I wonder if we have a Will see an international footballer advertising for McDonald's. I think they're England's, they're England, they're England's <laughs> official sponsor, one of their, yeah, one of their main sponsors, sponsors, aren't they? Are they? Yeah. Are, are they actually? Oh, of course, yeah. I didn't know that. But oh, the world is just... The thing with the money as well, though, if you look at the under-21s, we're talking about Conor Wickham and Michael Mancien. What contracts must they have had thrown at them once they started to make some kind of market under-21 level? I bet you there was like seven or eight clubs mm. it sort of piqued their interest that they start to have some consistent performances for the national side and all of a sudden the club throw like a, a ridiculous pay packet at someone so young. You must lose some incentive to actually really want to do that well, you know? Someone well, throws I've, you enough money yeah. for the rest I've, of your life. I've Why had this conversation want? in the past, you know, where with, with we, we only seem to see the back end of a player's actual career, really. You know, we see... We see a player at 22, 23, 24 making his break. And what you haven't seen is the, the progression they've made from five-year-old being in an academy system, which demands five days a week out of them, taking time out of school to train, um, travelling the, the length of the country to play other academy teams, um, constantly having the pressure year on year and not knowing whether you're going to be kept on. Um, getting to scholar level and then really starting to worry. And then beyond that, when you become a pro, not knowing really if you're going to make it at the club you're at. Um, I think I think what, when, when we see a player coming through at 23, 24-year-old, they're, they're already in the prime years and they're, they're, they're kind of at that money-earning stage where they've, they've put the hard yards in and you, you can see why they don't necessarily care. I know with England... Um, they apparently waive their fees, but I mean, the money they must make on sponsorship will obviously, oh. you know, count and product that. Yeah. But I think I think they well, think I mean, it's, a, it's a wider issue, isn't it? Really, I mean, we we aren't producing enough good players, but we don't help ourselves by the way we structure our national teams, the under twenty twenty threes. Um, like like's already been mentioned. Uh, how many of our best under twenty threes actually play in that squad? They don't because that's the way we pick yeah. our team, unfortunately. Yeah, you can't. Well, I think there's a, a sad thing, like with regards to um, the media, the way the media build up young players, and that can easily destroy a career before it gets started. So, I mean, like we've seen before, the players come through and they part, they get the hopes and dreams of an entire nation like pinned squarely on their well, shoulders, even if it is a match against Malta or something like. Yeah, that. I mean, I I kind of I agree with you in a, to an extent, but I think there's also got to be a bit of fingers pointed at, at people like Hodgson in the summer because if you're Raheem Sterling and you've had an absolute shocker of a, of a first season at Man City, you cost £49 million, pounds, the pressure is kind of already there. And, and you know, mm. and if you're, going to, if you're going to the Euros and, and you're, you know, you're an attacking player and, and people are already thinking, well, why is he in the squad? He's done nothing. Roy Hodgson should look at him and think, do you know what? He's just a young lad. Let's protect him. Let's you know. Let's not expose him to all this, but he, he did it anyway. And you know, so the, the... I, th I think their hands are forced, though, in that regard. I mean, anyone who takes that, we've said before. Obviously, when Allardyce left, we were all talking about it, and it's it was a poison chalice. I mean, <laughs> he managed he he can try and make things more difficult for himself than he certainly had to. But in reality. That is a point chalice taking a job because you are dealing with your bosses. If the FA want to make the money, yeah. then you can't whack down a piece of paper in front of them that says, yeah, I'm starting Mark Noble if he'd had a decent season so far, which he hasn't actually, but is I mean, his form over the last few years, he'd have been perfect for the England team, but they would yeah. never have done it. They would never have allowed it. So they clearly just whack down a piece of paper with the most marketable names on it and say, go out there and win the World Cup. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's never <laughs> going to happen. At a point, you start thinking... Does Gareth Southgate hold all the keys to be able to even pick his own squad? Because there's some players. I mean, Glenn Johnson. I mean, I know he he didn't play or anything, but him him getting a call up is just ridiculous. Um, yeah. It's just. I thought that was a bit strange. I, I, on a more positive note, I thought um, Jordan Henderson had an absolutely fantastic game. I thought he like. Yeah, he, that was a, that was a yeah. blinding cross. He looked he drove well, from midfield, and I think Klopp's turning him into a. Into a really classy midfielder. It's good to see. It's good to see because mm. he seems like a lovely bloke, and 
um, obviously the connection to Sunderland's it's always good, isn't it? Yeah. Which then, it's which it. then begs the question, doesn't it? Really, when we're talking about Wayne Rooney and what what value he adds to the England team, um, every manager who comes across him seems to want to make him captain. And then you've got Jordan Henson, the Liverpool captain there. You know what I mean? We're not. I, I would. I'm, I'm thinking about the Slovenia game midweek, and the, they're obviously going to bring in Dyer. You would have thought, which which then means Rooney's going to be accommodated in another position. And it's like, you know, we're at the stage now where that guy shouldn't be in the team. He's he, he is past it. For in yeah, life, he should just bow out, shouldn't he, with some dignity? Mm. Uh, you would think he'd do that. He'd be able to sim- being in that world, growing up around it. He must be able to look around himself and go, you know what, I'm not doing this team any favours. If he really had some sort of sense of national pride and he wanted the team to do well rather than himself but, to do well, or but keep, then you, you hear from you, know you hear from everybody that he's this great leader in the dressing room, off the pitch and stuff, and I think. No, I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't it. Have you ever heard the bloke open his gob? He strikes me as thick yeah. as two planks. Have you ever heard the bloke open his gob? You know, he, you know. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's the thing. That's the thing. <laughs> I think you've got to, you know, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite dangerous to assume that Wayne Rooney has any kind of uh, philosophical insight into into anything really. So. Um, I think yeah, when he's when yeah. he's looking around himself, yeah, he's point. probably not got you know he's probably not looking around thinking right. Let's analyze this situation and you know let's let's be philosophical <laughs> about it. I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, give him that kind of credit. But um, I mean they're bemoaning the fact that he's being booed by the by the fans. But ultimately, again, they're putting him in that situation because the fans aren't stupid. You know the fans see that he's not playing well. He's not in good form. He's been dropped by Man United, and they're being given you know explanations that you know Southgate and, and his managers are trying to say to the fans no no he's playing well he's he does a really good job he keeps you know he's really important for the team and you know football's football's not that complicated really I mean it's a working man's game we can all see that he's not in good form but I think people are just sick of being preached to and being told what a, a blatant lies and it's coming to a head with with booing him and and, you know, they're making their own problems, really, in that sense. I don't have any sympathy with, with him or with the FA or with any manager who picks him. I think you're bang on there, mm. Callum. I think it, it, it beggars belief. I don't think he's performed at club level for probably two years. I, the last time I actually thought Wayne Rooney was, was a top player was... It, I'd even go back as far when <clears throat> Ronaldo and Tevez were playing at United and the three of them were playing up front and they were they were tearing teams apart, but... I mean, he's done nothing at club level for me for years. And every time we get to tournament level, I, he bottles it. I mean, he scored... Well, that's the thing, he scored, scored, yeah. He scored all these goals for England. And people say, oh, he's you know, England's greatest ever goal scorer, this and that. Yeah, but it's all very well and good scoring three goals against, well, Bratislava, I don't know. But it, oh, when it comes yeah. to tournament level, he's got, what, three goals in the last three tournaments? It's just not good enough. Yeah, well, most of his goals come well, against plumbers and teachers, don't they? I mean, it's, it's never, <laughs> exactly right. you know, it's never, it's never against it. It's never on the big stage. It's never in like the tournaments. <clears> and, <throat> and ultimately, you know, you can point to his record and say, well, he scored all these goals, like you said. But I mean, you've you've also got to look at the context, and and you know, that's one of the reasons that it's so unappealing to watch England because most of the time, it's just it's just practice. It's just training games. That, that, that yeah, they're in. So I think we, I think we, we can all safely agree that none of us yeah. enjoy watching. <laughs> no, and, play and, and sad, we have you no faith have, in the like, future. There's something deep down inside that you still want them to do well, don't we? Exactly. Every tournament, not yeah. me. This like yeah. little inkling feeling that oh, we could do something special, or maybe all the press are right this time and they've built us up and we are going to do it. But ultimately, we do get let down. I think we covered it perfectly. That maybe it, it really is. It's the FA to blame. There's a set of a core of players there who make them money and they're never going to change their ways, unfortunately, until maybe they turn a profit or pay off Wembley. <laughs> as bad as that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> the latter right. that's the key. Moving that's the on key then, point, moving a little bit on. The from, Wembley point. Moving a little bit on from England. Cool. Moving that on. We've got some questions via, via Twitter from our Twitter audience, our loyal Twitter audience. I noticed, in fact, that one question is asked by a gentleman who asked last time, so... Yeah, why not keep seeing them out? Uh, on that note, talking about the international side, uh, Peter Cooper wants to know, if Sunderland were an international side, how well would we do in World Cup qualifying? <laughs> My answer to that is terribly. Absolutely We'd terribly. We'd beat Gibraltar, I think. I think. The only team we could beat is England. <laughs> it's the only team we could beat is England, ironically. Uh, the mm. People's Republic of North Anyone? Korea, maybe, would be uh, <laughs> about as good as we got, like... <laughs> 
Yeah, but on that, so I, I mean, you think yeah, no it would be interesting to see how club teams would weigh up against the international sides because Do you, know, I, you look at that England side and to me, there's, they, they look like strangers half the time. You'd probably be able to give them half, a half good game, even with yeah. the squad that we've got. Who, you know, who remembers Niall Quinn's testimony when we played the Republic? That was Republic brilliant. of Ireland. Be, that was when they had a decent team, that. I think we yeah. got 3-0. It was, yeah. it was just a throwaway game, like. But they had a half-decent team that around that time. I think it was when they'd, they'd done well in the World Cup in uh, 2002. It's pretty much the closest we'll ever get to seeing Sunderland play international football. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. But there we go. Fair enough. Oh, <laughs> right. We've got another question then. <clears throat> another question, this time from Zach McCaskill. If we remain this poor, I like this question, if we remain this poor, should we let Moyes take us into the Championship or bring someone else in? Can anybody clear up for me the parachute payments? I'm hearing so many different things. I'm hearing we'd only get 65 million, then I'm hearing we'd get like 150 million. If... I think I did a, a piece on it ages ago now, um, in pre-season. Uh, the way it worked out was... I think, as, as by my layman's maths, it turned out that we'd actually stand to gain more money from being relegated than we would from staying up in the Premier League. Because if we stay in the Premier League, I think it's something like at 17th place, which, let's be realistic, is what we're aiming for. It's our bar, sadly, now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I... You're looking at, like, 96 million, I think it was. Yeah. But if we got relegated, there's, like, three parachute payments of 30 million plus on top of what you've already got going down, um, I think you get about 115 million instead. I think it all depends. So yeah, I think it all it all depends on whether we come back up within those three years. You, you know, if we yeah. if we man if we manage to get back up, then then great. But money money isn't everything in the in the championship. I think we're you know as Sunderland fans we've been kind of spoiled when we're, whenever we've been in the championship and we've you know we've had some really good seasons. We've had some you know it, it's almost seen as a kind of a right for us to come straight back up, but. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a hell of a league to try and get yourself out of, and, and I think if you're a well-run club and you've, and you know, you, you're making correct, you're making the right decisions, and you've got a bit of nous about you, then yeah, I would, I would say, you know, it's, a, it would be good to come back, to go down, come back up within three seasons. But I don't have much faith in, in our, in the way our club's structured and some of the decisions I've seen them make. I don't know if we've got the kind of the organisation and the unity and the nous to really make the correct decisions. To come straight back up, yeah, it, you know, it would it would it would worry me. It'd be a massive risk. I mean, it, it, of course it would be, but if you know, if it all goes to plan, it's great. But nothing ever really goes to plan. In well, football. Not for us, like. <laughs> I well, I, I, get... I sent. Sorry, um, I sent. I sent the the article which I found from which was an interview with uh, Neil Redfern, who used to be Leeds manager, and I think he played for Wimbledon back in the day, so on. Um, who on radio in in Yorkshire has come out and said that he believes we need to we need to go down in order to rebuild and it's something that a lot of people um, say flippantly <clears throat> when things aren't going right and you just kind of think well it can't be much worse than the championship and we've seen this season obviously with yeah. Newcastle they've, they've, they've been fairly successful up now it's a long season but you, you do see teams go down there do well we've done it in the past under various managers as mentioned um, where we've instantly rebounded, but then at the same time you're looking at like Villa, who've spent yeah. just on two strikers over 30 million quid, yet have just sat the manager uh, two months into the season, and it's like, yeah, it's not always as easy as just going down and rebuilding. And people have obviously the question was that would we keep a hold of Moyes if and in in the event of relegation, um, knowing Ella Short's track record with managers. I don't think he would let it get to that stage. I think he would he would pull the trigger. As much as he claims to to love David Moyes, I think he's shown throughout his time as our chairman, anyways, that as soon as he thinks, yeah, this isn't working, he's got a pretty decent record at second managers and no one went to replace them. So to answer the question, mm. no, I don't think we would take David Moyes into the championship. Is is is. I don't yeah. think he'd stay even nah, if we offered, nah. even if somehow we offered. I think he feels he's above. I'd be mean, personally to be honest. I think that's half his problem. Maybe. <laughs> that he feels he's above things. Personally, like I'd that. keep I'd keep him. I'd stick with him, no matter how much. I've got a bit of disdain for him right now, but I do think I'm just I just crying out for some stability. Uh, we just we, we can't. We keep saying it. We can't go through this cycle of sacking managers. I mean, how many managers have we have we had in the past six years? 
Must have had about too eight many. Months. Wasn't it like nine in ten years, years or something? It's ridiculous stuff. It's because it's nuts, but you see, I mean, I think we're talking. We're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about stability, if we were to go down, how many players would stay? I mean, I don't. I don't think Defoe would stay. Um, I think we. I mean, I don't know whether there's anything in his contract that halves his wages. I remember someone saying Quinny brought that in at some point yeah, when he was at the well. at the club about like a relegation clause. But mm. you know, you, you're looking at like Kone. Yeah, I think Kone probably be off. I think you know someone would poach Pickford probably. You wonder about Manone. Bananol. We wouldn't be able to pay for Manquillo. Ban- Bananol Bananol would be off. Um, Danea would go back to Man City. Would Undong stay? You wonder about whether a promoted club would come in for Catamol, Kirchhoff probably at the end of his yeah. contract. You know, you, when you look at that, you're thinking, right, Yanazai goes back to Man United. There's so... You go down and the club. So, I'm sorry, <laughs> that just sounds so there's terrible. No one left. I mean, I'm really, I'm really <laughs> sorry. I mean, Depressed. Gav, are, are you driving? Are you anywhere? Gav, are you... <laughs> just I'm, in the, I'm in the, I'm in the car park. Oh, in my car. Gav, Gav, don't do it, man. Don't do it. He's got concrete. I'm, He's got concrete. I'm about 200 foot from Hellgate Metro Station. So I could <laughs> venture on the lines if this gets any worse. Like. Slam the, yeah, just slam the hand down and wait for it to all end. If, you think, though, if we did go <laughs> down, though, and you managed to keep you managed to keep a hold of Jermaine Defoe, that's as, as much of a guarantee to get back as we'd ever get. Because, I mean, that man, he's, yeah. I mean, he scores goals for fun in the Premier League. I think against championship defenders, his movement... And intelligence. I think we probably offer him offer him a, quite a bit of a race, you'd, you'd, yeah, you'd to be have, honest. You'd have to, to say we'll people. keep you at your wage currently, wouldn't you? And just say stay. And look, it's only because of his age that yeah, he'd stay. Exactly right. Do you know what I mean? If, if he was a few years younger, then he'd definitely be off. But at the age of thirty three now, although he's proven he can still do it in the Premier League, I can't see him thinking, "Oh, I'm definitely going to get a Premier League team here, and they're going to treat me the way that Sunderland yeah. treat me." Because um, we'd, we'd send them on for peanuts as well, and that would gut me. I'd hate to see Defoe go for like a couple of million or something. It'd be one point five million or something, wouldn't it? It'd be classic stuff. Yeah, I think on a short, yeah. we'd see it as a chance for a fire sale, though. I think if you look mm. at how much money we've hemorrhaged over like the last five years, the last set of books that came out, we weren't making as much money as the year before. Um, we were actually spending a lot more money. Like players' wages had jumped massively. We leaked over twenty-five million in the red just when you took everything into account that's how much we hemorrhaged I think Ella Short would just think okay this is the perfect opportunity just get rid of all the high the high earners at the club and just bring bring some mediocre crap in and I remember Borough going down haven't we done that already <laughs> I think <laughs> Borough did that when they went down and it was you know they brought in like players like Mark Yates and um, the Stockdale the young goalkeeper and you could just tell that it was an opportunity to like Consolidate the finances. They weren't looking to come back up, and I'm worried that would happen to us. We do you not take. Do you not, I'm looking. I'm up. looking at the likes of Donald Love. And well, yeah. I was. I was literally just about to say this, Damien. I think. I think there's a part of me, and I don't know whether anybody else feels like this, but there is. There's something at the back of my mind. Judges those signings and says they haven't been signed for this season. But by the same token, mm. some of the players which have become first team as this year, what more Gooch. Um, mm. Pickford even. I'm yeah. looking at those players and I'm thinking, are we are we doing this to set us up just in case? You know couple couple that with Moyes like complete depression and lack of faith in any yeah. kind of success. Well, I don't by any means he's clearly got that I don't by any bit. means think that he wants to be relegated. I don't think the club mm-hmm. do. I just no, think I don't think he wants it. I don't think he feels No, he but I think like... I think I think there will be some sort of contingency there thinking, right, if this is the year we go down, we need to have something in place to back up, do you know, and and and, yeah, I mean, and pe- people can people can say, well, that that bollocks, but I don't think that was the case. I think I think when you're looking at signings like McNair and Love, who for the for the money we've spent, you would expect at least McNair to be a first team player. And although he has played a little yeah. here and there, he isn't ready yet. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, are we are we bringing these players in just in case we go down? You know, I mean, I I look at I look at Kone, the Kone situation and and his contract, and I think right, he signed this new contract. I don't think none of us are expecting him to be here for five years like he's signed and, and you know, he's yeah. he's on 90 grand. And I think part of that, I mean, the way I've seen him play, the way Moyes talks about him, there's definitely no love lost there. Um, I think what Moyes has, has done is said, right, I don't have time to replace you or to scout for a replacement. Put it, you know, make him happy until January. I wouldn't be surprised to see him leave in January, get money in, and then we've had time to scout a replacement and possibly add a few more players as well. I wouldn't be surprised to see that at all. So I think there is definitely 
a contingency plan going on. And I, I, that Kone contract to me just looks like let's just keep him happy for now while we look for a few more players. Speaking, speaking of transfers and contracts, we've got one last question from Sam Quickly. That's an awesome name, though. Sam Quickly. Do you think Mvia would have made a difference this season with the squad oh we God. have? I'll tell you hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Just before we continue this, I'm just going to open me. <laughs> oh, no. But I, it's all, I mean, we're <laughs> sick of hearing his name now, aren't we? Um, but you got to think, the lad seemed, seemed to, he genuinely, I hate to use the phrase, but he seemed to love the club. He seemed to really buy in. The, the part where we seem to miss him, I think, is energy in covering for fullbacks. Because I think that's what I've noticed, where I think the fact that he his legs in midfield have gone, he I think he used to drop in and fill in for people like Van Arnold when he goes walkabout quite a lot. And that's one of the areas we've really, really missed him this year. Well, you know, for me, as though, I think I think Woodham Villa have stopped the goal going in against Southampton. Would he have, would he have prevented Gillibodji gifting Harry Kane a goal? Would he have... Gifted, mm. the, would he have prevented the two goals with gifted Palace? You know, that's that's the that's the thing for me. As good a player as he is, and he could have made a difference organisationally. I just think our issues this season have come down individual errors generally, and and, and he wouldn't have done much. I mean, for that. arguably, we 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 wouldn't have made those mistakes if he was passing the ball where we were used maybe, to passing. Maybe, maybe, you know I mean? maybe, but um, but yeah, it's know. a moot point, really, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah. We we can't really. I think it would really have at least okay. more so than could he have done anything on the pitch. It would have at least shown that we had maybe a little bit more desire and would maybe have given the fans a lift at the beginning of the season. When yeah. we go out and spend mm. 13 million on Ndong, and don't get me wrong, he's actually looked kind of good this season. But when they were touting the figure of like five or six million from him for him to buy him out of his, his contract, it's like it's less than half what we paid for the guy who replaced him. It almost seems in a business sense like. It was a, a Phil Yeah, Zaren. it does seem he's very he's very much like like yeah. him there, isn't he? And Dom, I think I think we were having that chat. I mean, there's probably. there's a lack of there's a lack yeah. of clarity as well. I mean, you know, we're we're told you know, oh well, you know, we're going to try and go for for younger players, British players, you know, look for the future and stuff like that. And you think, well, does Avila fit into that? But then he goes and signs Gillibodji, who's 27, 28, and you know, and you think, well, right, well, perhaps they wanted to get Avila in January for free. So okay, I suppose you can see the business sense in that. It's a risk, but but then we're, t- we're told, oh, we might be signing a new contract to Kazan. He seems to be back in the fold there. But Moyes has said, yeah, there's an agreement in place, but no one's announced it. And, you know, I think there's a lot of this. There's just a lack of clarity about this situation, and, and, and it's and it's really sour. I think we could well. use an entire episode of the podcast to <laughs> sit down and analyse every single transfer dealing from some, yeah. every bit of business because it would take hours and hours and hours to sift through it and it would be so confusing. He did bring about the anyway, most entertaining day time. on Twitter though with the cans for Jan Crack on deadline day. <laughs> <laughs> it was superb. Yeah, that was, that was, that was fun. <laughs> right. Um, what are we dealing with next? Well, I suppose moving on now to our next opponents. We go up against Stoke City. Oh, I can't say I'm looking forward to no. it. I've got some stats in front of me. I'm going to kick off with some stats that made me feel a little bit more comfortable, but stats don't mean everything. But still, right, they've conceded four goals in three games this season. So in three individual games, they've conceded four goals, uh, conceded four goals apiece. All right, they've drawn their last two games, one all, and they haven't scored any more than one goal in any single game. So to me, that strikes me as the sort of thing where we've got to uh, score two goals and then sit back. No, you know what that tells me, Damien? That tells me that tells me we're going to get absolutely tanked. And like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and once people start reeling stats off like that, it was like, you know what it reminded us of? It reminded us of that when, when QPR came to the stage of light and hadn't won one, any yeah. one of the 20, 20 or so away games. Yeah. It was 20, 20 odd away games that hadn't won. And then they turn up at the stadium of light yeah. and, and turn us over with ease. And it was embarrassing yeah, we just, as well. They were like, it, 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 it makes you shit, yeah, doesn't it, when it, people it's, say, oh, they haven't scored against someone at the stadium of light. It's like they're bound to. They're just bound to. <laughs> I mean, I mean being, being sensible about it, really. We, we, if we are really serious as a team about kicking on and not struggling, then they have to target the game for three points. If, if, if all I see on the pitch is us just going out um, trying to defend and, and, and nick a goal to me that sends mm. a wrong message like because these are a poor team like Absolutely. we are and we we have to we have to turn up there and think right we're gonna we're gonna come and take three points off you because if we don't we're, we're, we're looking at a 
a, a very, very serious issue in terms of yeah. how we're going to struggle across the season. And, and on top of that, winning against Stoke could lift you above two teams, two, three teams, with West Ham to play, who are also struggling. It's a massive game, really. Is. I think, yeah, I think the, the, the thing that really worried me was the Man United-Stoke game when I saw Peter Crouch come on and I thought... Oh, he's gonna he's gonna play himself into the contention for the next game, and he because whenever he plays against us, he seems to do quite you know he seems to cause our defenders so much trouble, and and you know he came on against Man United, he put himself about a bit, and then they equalise, and you think, oh, he's he's gonna start against us, isn't he? And he's gonna you know he's gonna make Gillibodji look like so the idiot he is, yeah, and, you, and, and, and he's gonna look like track the ball under his feet and get it in front of him unaccountably. I never understood why that man rolls yeah. or how he can dribble a ball. It literally, it's just pure luck. It bounces off his knees and his his calves and stuff like that, and then he somehow manages to bundle it into. But the you see, yeah, I mean, I'm just you, you, you look happen. you look at players like Crouch and Walters will probably come back in as well, and and then they'll probably look a lot more solid, and they'll have that kind of grit about them, that experience that that'll probably you know that might make a difference and. And that, that, it's the same with what you know. What Gav said, you you worry when stats like this are reeled off when we are coming up against teams, it's, mm. and, uh, and and you know. Well, don't worry, I'm re- I'm reeling them off, <laughs> so it's not. I'm not building it up. I think we're gonna we're gonna lose. But. Well, do you know you know what you know what worries me slightly as well. Um, I know it's a total so. moot point, but Lukaku hadn't scored in ages. Um, scored two for Belgium and then played us on the Monday. And, and turned us over. Oh, and there's an order of it scored twice against Wales midweek, and I was like, oh no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's I'm it just it just I, I'm just getting deja vu with things like that. But I'm I'm come on, <laughs> really we we have to look at this and go. It doesn't matter who Stoke have got. We know we've got they've got a strong side on paper, but they're struggling massively. So are we. Yeah. But it's away from home. We're clearly better away from home, and we have to get three points. It's, it does by hook or by crook. Doesn't matter how we do it. We have to come away with three points, and and we, if we don't, I what worry. Is the crook though, historically, because we haven't got the hook, and I don't know what the bloody crook is in our team because we don't seem to have <laughs> that sort of like. No matter what happens, we've got to come away it, with points. Where is me? Like, if we don't score more goals than them, then where we, is me as well? We how well they played? Don't Sorry, how me? It worries me that they played pretty well against Man United. If you watch, I don't know if anybody else watched the game, but. They actually, oh, they actually looked oh. all right at times. Uh, and I'm sitting watching it thinking, Stoke had the exact same start the last season. They were really slow out the blocks. They had like a, f- a fair amount of new players gelling in. And I think the same's happened this season. And I bet, honestly, I bet um, every one of their fans, when they're sitting in the club or when they're having a pint with each other, they're saying, oh, this will be the game that kickstarts the season. This is where Boney's going to grab a couple of goals. This is where the likes of Shakiri and Co come to town and turn up and give a performance and I, I can just you know that all the teams languishing at the bottom are failing like that and that's not only worrying because that suggests how badly we're thought of but it also says that we don't have any metal or grit in our team that people think it's going to be an easy day that people are going to score goals and find form against us I think we need to like can you even imagine can you even imagine their the team talk dressing room and that just like do they even have to bother with tactics or anything like that they must just be sitting there Clapping each other on the shoulder, like right, you just go out there and do your own thing, it'll be fine. If you're going to try and put a, which is if you put a positive spin on it, though, I mean, Allardyce looked awful at times last season, and we were sitting questioning, oh, what's he doing with um, the substitutions? The tactics didn't fit, and he turned it round. So maybe trying to be on a bit, a little bit more positive, maybe David Moyes will get it right this game, and he'll put a team up that looked really good, think, that yeah, they look threatening, yeah. and he turns it around. I think, I think I, that's I, it. I, I do, we do very well against Stoke historically. We well, see we beat them most seasons. I think, don't we? I just I have a feeling that the the players seem to play with a bit more freedom away from home. This crowd, I think, at the Stadium of Light, when things aren't going well, can be can be really challenging for them because it can get really edgy. <laughs> I, I fancy us if you keep it tight in the first twenty minutes, the Britannia will feel equally as edgy for Stoke because yeah. they're not in good form. And when you've got someone like Jermaine Defoe, we've, we've always got a chance. I fancy us to nick yeah. it. So I think I think it is far more important how we approach it. You know what Moyes chooses to do with with how he's going to set the team up, who he's going to pick. Um, I, I I think if we go there for a draw, I'd seriously question it because their defence has looked shaky. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've watched their game against Palace, but they were all, like all over the place. And, appalling, weren't they? Uh, oh, and, and you know, you'd, you'd hope that, that Moyes would go, all right, well, 
you know, let's go there and, and let's let's make them let's make them anxious. Let's give them a a good game. Let's try and get three points because at the end of the day, we've only taken one from nine against Borough, Palace, and West Brom, and so that's kind of put the pressure on us to really against Stoke and West Ham try and go out and win these games. And you know, if if Moyes tries to play for a draw, you know, tries to get a point, and and you know, gives Stoke gives Stoke too much respect in a way, then I, I I'd be I'd be concerned about that. So hopefully, pick something that's a bit positive. You know, maybe goes with the three five two. Well, you know. On that note, looking back, I suppose we should. I know it's been a week now, and it'll be another week, but hopefully that'll have given them some time, or at least given Moyes some time to assess the tactical changes he had to make. Um, yeah, in in the last match, so. Does anyone think he'll be looking at that and looking at a back three or something like that and actually apply it to this game? Do you think this will be the time when he experiments? Do you think he found that that was actually quite a good idea and we got something? He'll be looking at his injury list. Nine players. Nine players out injured. Deny is on that list. It seems it seems to be consistently about eight or nine this season. I think that's half half of the battle. it It really is. Something that Allardyce seemed to be fantastic at that Moyes can't seem to grasp is the recovery. I think we spoke about the cryotherapy and things like that, didn't yeah. we, in the chat? No, we'll see, we'll see, um, and whether that actually... We seem to be picking up a lot of muscle injuries, almost, which, yeah, is, yeah, which yeah, is the worrying yeah. thing. Because yeah. you look at the list, and you look at that, that list, and every single one of those players could theoretically get in that team. I mean, Kirchhoff, yeah. Pickford, Anichibi, Katnamol, Pina, Yanazai, Barini, Manone, Larson. That's not that's and all of them are. It's a uh, nucleus hamstrings. of a team, that. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. I think we're missing Barini. I think it's come to my attention. I mean, I know he doesn't bang in a load of goals and that, but he seems to have quite a. Um, what's the word? Like a, he has a good effect this on the rest of the team. The he seems to, he's, he's quite positive. This is on the, the board, isn't as well, isn't he? Because he's a, he wins your clever fouls and he's he's a he's a he's, mm. a, he's a professional. He seems to where where someone like Watmore, he's got all the desire in the world, he's not quite clever enough on the pitch at times to know when to, to go to ground or to, to win a tactical free kick. He just seems to be like head down and off he guns. Where Barini seems to get you some free kicks in and around the box. Um, he's, we massively miss him, in my opinion. Well, do you know what it tells me, though, is I, I was sitting in, the, in May thinking that left midfield was a position we'd be trying to strengthen in the summer. And now we're sat here kind of pining for Barini to return and it, it shows really the top and bottom of where we are and, and how, how badly we're mm. recruited and where we are in terms of injuries that we're, that we're pining for a player like Barini because for me, he struggled for a lot of last season. It wasn't until the Palace game, was it really, when he, when he scored that great goal where he, yeah. he forced his win into Aldice's plans? So, I think that's, that, you know, yeah, I think last season a lot of players, Barini... You know, Kabul, Kirchhoff, they all benefited from, like Damien, Damien was saying, that Allardyce's ability to really cater recovery and fitness for individual players. And, you know, Kabul, he had a slow start, and people have been comparing him to Jilabodji and the fact that they both had slow starts. But the thing about Kabul is that he's always had an injury history. He's always, you know, he, he had, I don't think he'd played for about 10 months when we when we got him and he and he was in, him yeah, and he was, and he was well, in and out of, he was in and out of our team for the first few months. Whereas Jilabodji, that it's it's not so I I don't think it's about fitness with him. Whereas with Kabul, I think we started to see his best form when he was when he really got his fitness, and that that for me is the the kind of the distinction between those two players. Because people are saying, oh well, if Kabul did it, why can't Jilabodji do it and you know really win us over? And and I think that distinction has to be made. The fitness distinction, um, you know, whether it's in their heads or whether it's whether it's a, an actual you know physical uh, problem with their training and recovery, I don't know, but. Um, I, I think last season there, it, it definitely seemed to help a lot of these players like Barini and Kabul and Kirchhoff to, to, and Defoe as well. I mean, Defoe was playing two games in a week at 33, whereas this season, you know, touch and go whether he was starting the Man City game. He had a knock midweek a few weeks ago. You know, you, you're wondering whether you're on borrowed time with him as well. And that's, and you, that's a massive yeah. concern. Yeah, you, you know, we, we, heard, we heard that in the build to the West Brom game that the players had been completely beasted by Moyes because he was focused on winning the game and in that period we're, we're picking up a number of injuries muscle injuries so I kind of do worry about that like because it, it going forward mm. we don't have the biggest squad and we're, we're playing people out of position as it is and when you it, it, when you've got like eight nine people injured at a time that that doesn't spell 
well, it doesn't smell good for the future really because we've got we've got a long season ahead and we can't really afford to have key players missing as long as we are. It's like three months at a time, you know. Mm. And it, it, we, we are struggling. We're struggling massively. We need we need. It's like I said before, he wasn't he wasn't really a player I saw as a first teamer ahead, but you know. As it is, Barini is quite an important player for us. We need him back, really, because, we, we like you like already said, um, we're missing the, just some clever players on the pitch, you know. And, and even then, he's got a goal in him. How many of our midfielders do? You know? mm. The um, if you look at the look yeah. at the injuries, I mean, I'm looking at the return dates. It, it, it says online, and I mean, in theory, I mean, we could have Catamol, Pinar, and each be Pickford all back for Stoke. Um, which is that's I mean that's got to take some positive I guess um, if we can get I think Stephen Pienaar back I think he adds a lot more quality in the middle of the park than what we've what, than someone like McNair certainly um, and if Catamol plays alongside someone like Ndong there's a lot of legs in there um, and I think there's a lot more fight depends if we play with that back five though doesn't it again because if if you're going to play with a back five that includes uh, you know, Denia or, or Gillibodji, then in front of them you probably need two holding players and a number 10. Who that number 10 is, is anyone's guess, but I'm going to suppose it'll be Kazri based on his performance uh, against West Brom, you know. So again, that, that at least it's a nice problem to have, isn't it, really? Pienaar Pienaar's is pulled up with an injury in his last game. I don't know whether he'd be ready to start yet, but he's certainly an option off the bench mm. if we aren't holding the ball properly, which was a big issue for much, much of the West Brom game. Really, we, we struggled with possession until Rodwell came on, to be honest. Yeah. Um, who who's another player who could well start? So then... I know we say this every week, but um, and we always say like, oh, this this game, this will be it. You know, this is where we finally judge the team. I honestly think this this has to be, and I think if we say it now and we, we stick to it, this really is the game that we we judge the season by. In all honesty, there was like a glimmer of hope against West Brom when we switched uh, the formation and we made a couple of little tactical changes. We looked fairly threatening at times. If we do that again and we see more encouraging signs against Stoke, then I think we have sort of a right to have that little spark of optimism still linger on a little bit longer. But if Stoke come out and tear us to pieces, then I think all the people who give us a little bit of jip online and say, oh, he's so negative, you know, positivity, things can only get better. I think we need to take a, a real long, hard look um, if we don't do well the coming weekend and, and really say, right, that's it, we're in for a, a real long, hard slog. How can we get points? If we see David Moyes' team come and gel together a little bit more and we see Ndong and Kazri sort of forge some kind of relationship, if we nullify Stoke but look a little bit edgy and have a little bit of attack and threat, then I think finally we can sort of increase our optimism levels a little bit. Maybe Gav doesn't need to <laughs> put a ban on travel by car. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get some, we'll all get some candy <laughs> just in case for the next one. Just in case we do it, have so. to analyse that. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, and sweet. Well, um, I won't bother with predictions because we've got absolutely no idea how this is going to pan out. Um, but, yeah, so I suppose all that's left to say is that's pretty much all we've got time for. Um, thanks for listening. We will be on iTunes this week. I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> by hook or by crook, whenever the crook is. Um, yeah, so you'll be able to subscribe finally. That's my fault. I've pulled my fingers out. We're gonna we can sort it out now. So yeah, until next week, look after each other. Fingers crossed, we'll have something to celebrate. Uh, this is the Worker Report signing off.